The Brood is a 1979 Canadian psychological horror film directed by David Cronenberg, a director known for pioneering the subgenre known as body horror, a style of horror that focuses on the fragility of the body. Graphic psychological violations of the body can be manifested through abnormal sex, mutations, or experimental science. It is the third entry in his Bioterror trilogy, along with Shivers and Rabid. While it's a bit tame compared to the gore scene in his previous films, more dimensional characters and a newfound emotional depth bring this film more gravitas. It marks a huge step for Cronenberg as a director and would help solidify his style throughout the 80s with films like Videodrome, The Fly, and Dead Ringers. While Cronenberg was trying to develop a script called The Sensitives, which would later become Scanners, he claimed the story of the brood demanded to be written. Going through a custody battle with his ex-wife at the time for their daughter fueled the story behind the brood. It's an emotionally searing depiction of divorce and the trauma it inflicts on children. It's also a critique of the self-help movement and the dangers of tapping into repressed memories of trauma. It suggests that psychological treatment can be more self-serving than altruistic. Another far more successful film about divorce, Kramer vs. Kramer, had just been released. Cronenberg noted how false and saccharine its depiction of divorce was, and wanted to truly explore the anger and frustration that people during a divorce truly feel. In his book Cronenberg on Cronenberg, he stated that it was his most personal film, and that The Brood is my version of Kramer vs. Kramer, but more realistic. The plot centers around Frank Carveth, a man trying to protect his daughter Candace from her mother Nola, who is being treated by a suspicious psychiatrist named Dr. Raglan. Frank is essentially a stand-in for Cronenberg himself. Frank is picking up his daughter Candace from a visit with his ex-wife Nola, who is currently undergoing an experimental form of therapy called psychoplasmics at Soma Free Institute. Raglan conducts role-play therapy with a patient named Mike, who he berates and bullies while he plays the role of Mike's father. Finally, Mike reaches an emotional catharsis when he lets go of his repressed childhood trauma. The relief is short-lived because it is discovered that he has lesions all over his body. Psychoplasmics encourages patients with emotional trauma to release these repressed emotions, which manifest with physiological changes to the body. Frank discovers bruises on his daughter's back. He confronts Dr. Raglan about the abuse and tells him that Nola will no longer have contact with Candace. Seeking his lawyer's legal advice, he is told he cannot do anything because the legal system believes in motherhood. This leads Frank on a quest to find proof that Nola is unstable and that her doctor is a fraud. Frank drops Candace off at her grandmother Juliana's house. Juliana appears to be estranged from her daughter Nola. She suggests that Nola is spiteful and blames her for abuse that never happened because she has a distorted image of the past. Your child's version of the past, that is. Juliana, Candace is only five. She's working on it right now, believe me. 30 seconds after you're born, you have a past. And 60 seconds after that, you start to lie to yourself about it. This quote may reflect an ambivalence towards the existence and validity of repressed memories. Repressed memories are memories that have been unconsciously blocked due to the memory being associated with a high level of stress or trauma. The theory is that these memories can emerge later in the consciousness. The existence of repressed memories is a controversial topic in psychology. Most dispute its existence entirely. They argue that this is in fact rather a process through which false memories are created by blending actual memories and outside influences on part of the psychologist. Was Nola truly abused, or is Dr. Raglan simply using techniques like guided imagery to manipulate a specific response from her? Meanwhile, Dr. Raglan is conducting a therapy session with Nola. He adopts the persona of Candace, asking why Nola hit her. Nola denies it. We are given hints that Nola was abused by her mother routinely. There appears to be a skepticism toward this belief in motherhood, as we mentioned earlier. 
In fact, the film suggests that divorce and childhood abuse are somehow hereditary given the way these issues have rippled through three generations of the family. This inherited baggage could be physical when Juliana mentions to Candace that Nola was constantly in the hospital because of physical bumps and sores. After hearing strange noises coming from the kitchen, Juliana goes to investigate. There she is attacked by a dwarf-like child who bludgeons her to death. Candace is traumatized by the attack, but left unscathed. The police arrive and instruct Frank to get the full story from Candace, who is almost catatonic after witnessing the event. During another therapy session, Dr. Raglan speaks to her using the persona of her father, Barton. From Nola, we discover that her father was neglectful and ignored the abuse her mother doled out. This coincides with Barton's return to town after the death of his estranged wife, Juliana. He attempts to see Nola to inform her of her mother's death, but Raglan turns him away. Later on, Frank invites Candace's teacher, Ruth, to dinner so they can discuss Candace's well-being. He fears he's screwed up his kid already, but seems to blame it all on Nola. Now, sometimes when I'm being easy on myself, I say, well, it's not your fault. You got taken in. You got involved with a woman who married you for your sanity, hoping it would rub off. Instead, it started to work the other way. Frank is interrupted by a phone call from Barton, who is drunk and distraught. He says that he is going to rescue Nola, with or without help from Frank. Frank leaves Candace under Ruth's care to make sure Barton is alright. However, before he gets there, Barton is murdered by another child of the brood. Upon arrival, Frank discovers the body and encounters the creature, which promptly drops dead. He goes to the police from there. The police autopsy reveals that the creature is anatomically unique in the fact that it's asexual, toothless, and missing a navel, indicating no signs of natural human birth. At this point, it's obvious Nola is somehow in control of the mutated dwarf children, and that they are targeting those who have wronged her. She is simply another victim of childhood trauma and ineffectual parents, who is now being manipulated by her own psychiatrist. Nola seems to respond the most to this new form of therapy, for better or worse. This is Cronenberg's third film with a male scientific antagonist who tests out their experimental treatment on unsuspecting women. Nola is not inherently evil, but she's been made to attack first through years of systematic abuse. It is implied that she doesn't even know how destructive the brood are, or that they're even targeting those who have wronged her. She's clearly not in control of her powers. Nola calls home when Ruth answers. She suspects what might actually be true, that Frank is trying to give Candy a better mother figure with Ruth. Nola threatens Ruth, who hangs up immediately. Is this Mrs. Carver? Are you and my husband having your own private PTA meeting, Miss Mayor? I won't even bother to answer that. No! After hearing about Nola's parents, Raglan concedes that the murders coincide with his sessions with Nola and could have motivated the murders. He closes Soma free and sends away the other patients. Frank finds out about this news from Mike, the patient we saw at the beginning of the movie. He informs him that Nola is the only patient that Raglan is interested in now. The implication that Raglan is also sexually attracted to Nola is made explicit when he says, At Candy's school, two more of the brood sneak into Candace's class and murder Ruth in front of all the students. The scenes of violence in this film are effective because unlike his other films, the film builds tension and a sense of dread first. We were forced to watch these children lose their innocence as they helplessly witness traumatic violence. The brood then abduct Candace. The film's most iconic image is of the brood walking Candy down a desolate winter road. It's become clear that Frank and Nola's fight for control over Candace has taken precedence over Candy herself. She has become subject to horrific trauma in two places a child should be safest. Her grandmother's in her school. Her vacant expression and silent affect is proof that both mother and father have failed to protect their daughter. Frank ventures to Soma Free to find his daughter and is met by Dr. Raglan, 
he finally explains that the dwarf children are manifestations of her past emotional trauma and repressed anger. They're her children, Frank. More exactly, they're the children of her rage. They're motivated only by her anger, whether that's anger is conscious or subconscious. I mean, when, when Nola got cross with Candy last weekend, annoyed, really, the brute beat her. But when she released her rage against her parents under therapy, and they killed them. And now I didn't want to believe that. But now they've killed Ruth Mayer. And they could kill you or me, and she wouldn't even be aware of it. Realizing things have gone too far, Dr. Raglan martyrs himself to save Candace from the brood. Meanwhile, Frank attempts to distract Nola without provoking her deadly rage. Frank fakes a reconciliation with Nola, who starts to see that he is lying and wants nothing to do with her anymore. Let me be with you. I want to go with you wherever you go. Do you? She tests him by revealing the full effects of psychoplasmics, an external womb in the shape of a sack hanging off her stomach. She gives birth to another child of the brood and licks the fetus. This is how the brood are born. Noticing his disgust, Nola is angered, which wakes the brood up, who promptly kill Raglan. Nola tells Frank that she'd rather have Candace dead than taken away from her. I'd kill Candace before I'd let you take her away from me. Do you hear me? Which makes Candace the next target of the brood. With no other option of hope that Nola can be helped, Frank strangles her to death. Without the psychic connection to their mother, the brood die off immediately. Frank carries Candace to the car and they drive away. However, we see that Candace too has the small bumps her mother did as a child, indicating that she has inherited the horrible ordeal her mother has been through. This is a terribly upsetting ending, but it rings true emotionally. Our past always stays with us, especially when regards to family. In this case, the wounds are real, physically as well. When children witness their parents fight, they internalize it. When one parent attacks the other, they are symbolically attacking the child, too. Some critics have accused Cronenberg of harboring misogynistic ideas in his films by portraying women as monstrous and vampiric beings with sinister motives, as film historian Robin Wood has noted. Barbara Creed's concept of the monstrous feminine argues that horror films often perceive women, their anatomy, and sexuality as inherently dangerous and threatening to patriarchal society's concern over masculinity and changing gender roles. She suggests that the very process of female reproduction and birth is intimidating to men and gross to the male gaze. This would explain Frank's revulsion at seeing Nola in her true state and why he strangles her. However, this is after Nola threatens to kill Candace rather than give her up to Frank. David Cronenberg wanted to convey the emotional reality of a situation he lived through, and succeeded wildly in that regard. Any hostility towards the character of Nola is more of a reflection on his relationship with his wife than his ideas of women in general. Unfortunately, critics did not pick up on the themes of the film and its subtext. They dismissed it as another gross-out picture with no depth. However, it has been reevaluated over the years and has aged the best out of Cronenberg's early films. It'll always perhaps be the saddest and most poignant horror film I've ever seen. Its influence can be seen in films like Hereditary or The Babadook, which also detail family trauma and the uncertainty of parenthood. My rating for The Brood is a 10 out of 10. This concludes my retrospective on The Brood. Thank you for watching and please subscribe.